Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to our Blindness and Diabetes webinar, where we will be discussing the Dexcom and Freestyle Libre uh, continuous glucose monitoring devices. We are so excited uh, to be doing this in collaboration with Penn Medicine. Uh, so we first want to thank, well, thank everybody here for tuning in. And we also want to extend a huge, huge thank you to Penn Medicine and Abby uh, for putting this on with us. We had close to a thousand registrants, um, which is absolutely incredible. And we're so, so thankful. And it's just been incredible planning it all, especially with Abby. So thank you. Uh, for those of you who are just now joining us for the first time or just now hearing about us, uh, we are Accessible Pharmacy Services for the Blind. Excuse me. <laughs> we are a home delivery pharmacy and we specialize in the needs of the blind, low vision, and deaf blind. We are the only provider of its kind and we are the largest blind owned healthcare company in the country. Uh, my, na my name is Alexandra and I am the Senior Director of Business Development and Communications with Accessible Pharmacy. Uh, and once again, just thank you for being here. Um, I have a couple of more thank yous to give out. We owe a huge thank you to uh, Marsha Drenth with the NFB, the National Federation for the Blind, for her insight with this webinar topic. And we are also very grateful for our own pharmacy team, especially Dr. Eric Wagman and Dr. Jason Barrett for their knowledge and their expertise in the diabetes space. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to do this webinar without them. And lastly, I wanna thank everyone who submitted questions to be answered by Abby during the webinar. So she'll be answering a lot of these questions and we will also be reaching out uh, to everybody after the webinar that submitted these questions to further those conversations after we're done today. Uh, she won't be taking any live questions during the webinar. So if you have any further questions that you would like answered or discussed, uh, please feel free to call us directly. Our phone number is 1-888-633 7007. That's 1 888 633 7007. And we will also have Abby's contact information um, available after the webinar and on our website page. Uh, throughout this webinar, Holly is here uh, to supply us with ASL interpretation. So thank you, Holly. And this webinar will also have live closed captioning. After the webinar is over in the next few days, we will be sending out a follow up email. That follow-up email will have links to the video and audio recordings of the webinar, uh, resources from the webinar and Abby, as well as a chance for you to respond with feedback, which we really, really encourage and appreciate so that we know what we need to do for our next webinar. Um, and before we get started, I just want to quickly run through some announcements. We've got some really exciting things going on that I just want to tell you about really quickly. Uh, to start, we are approaching conference season. Um, we're super excited to be virtually and physically attending several conferences this fall. Uh, so we'll be delighted to speak with many of you further, uh, whether that be you know in a virtual format or at an in-person conference in the next coming months. And secondly, uh, if you haven't heard, we recently launched the news of our upcoming Blind Health Expo, and we're absolutely thrilled with the feedback we've been getting. Our Blind Health Expo will be a completely virtual event on Friday, December 2nd from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern time. It will be the largest virtual expo of healthcare information, healthcare products, services, uh, and medication for individuals who are blind, deaf blind, or who have low vision. It's absolutely free to attend, it's free to exhibit. We are already approaching 75 exhibitors and we already have thousands of attendees signed up. Um, our attendees range from consumers to patients, to providers, to nonprofits, government agencies, you name it. Um, and as I said before, we just can't believe the feedback we've gotten so far. So we're so, so excited. Um, and whether you want to attend and just check out all those exhibitors for the day, um, you know, virtually, or if you would like to exhibit yourself, uh, we would absolutely love to have you. Um, so please just come and check out our website page. So if you would like more information, you can visit the Blind Health Expo tab on our website. Also, please feel free to share the Blind Health Expo information with as many people as possible. As I said, it's free to attend, free to exhibit, and it's a completely virtual event. Okay, now I will stop talking, and it is my absolute pleasure, pleasure excuse me, to introduce our speaker for today. Um, and as I mentioned before, we are doing this webinar in collaboration with Penn Medicine, and we are so thankful to have Abby, Abby Chesterson with us to speak today. She is the director of the Diabetes Education Center at Penn Medicine, and the, uh, which is the University of Pennsylvania Health System. Abby is absolutely amazing. Uh, she is a diabetes education champion, uh, and we're just so thankful that we get to work alongside of her. So please take it away, Abby. 
Thanks so much, Alex. Of um, course. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Let me see here. So it's telling me that participant screen sharing is disabled. I figured. Let me, <laughs> let me change that. Now you should be good. All right. Perfect. All right, everybody. So I'm just going to get our stuff, ourselves set up here. All right, Alex, can you see the slides? Okay, perfect. Yes. All right, so like Alex said, my name is Abby Chesterson. I am a registered dietitian by training and a certified diabetes care and education specialist. Um, I've been working with the diabetes population specifically for about seven years now. Um, so I was really excited to approach this topic. Um, I learned quite a bit through the process. Um, so that was really exciting for me as well. Um, so I'm really hopeful that, um, you know, if you guys have questions afterwards, please feel free to um, send them over to Accessible Pharmacy. I am more than happy to delve in, learn a little bit more, see what I can find find out um, and get back to you if I don't know the questions answer off the top of my head. So like Alex was saying, today's topic is going to be continuous glucose monitor use, or the abbreviation that we'll use is CGM. And we're going to be talking about the accessibility features of these monitors for the blind and low vision community. So Continuous glucose monitor or CGM technology um, helps to monitor someone's blood sugar levels without having to poke a finger and get a blood sample. So a CGM is a device that automatically tracks blood sugar levels for someone without, again, having to poke their finger for a blood sample. Um, this makes this piece of technology a huge help for the blind and low vision community, who we all know has a lot of difficulty with setting up a needle and a lancing device, getting that blood drop and getting that blood drop onto a test strip in just the right place. Um, CGM technology really works with a tiny fiber that's inserted under the skin. Um, each CGM that's out there does utilize an insertion device, so someone is not going to see a needle that's inserting this fiber. Um, it all happens really with the click of a button, um, and so it's very easy to utilize these um, technologies. The fiber itself that stays under the skin is going to measure the sugar level in the fluid in between our cells. Um, so this is called interstitial fluid from a medical perspective. Um, these uh, CGMs are gonna measure blood sugar levels about every few minutes. We'll talk more specifically about each one independently. The fluid, or I'm sorry, the sugar level on a CGM may vary slightly from the sugar level that we would get if we were to poke a finger to check a blood sugar level. This is simply just a reflection of the different type of fluid that we're measuring. Um, and we do expect some difference. Um, if we're seeing large differences, if someone is doing a verification finger poke, um, we would want to troubleshoot that with you um, to make sure that we are successfully getting accurate readings from your glucose sensor. Um, CGMs use a transmitter to send to, I should say, wirelessly send blood sugar information to a receiver device. Um, so whether the transmitter is attached to a sensor site or whether it's kind of an all in one sensor site, including the transmitter, that's how the information is sent from your body to your uh, receiver device. CGMs can send information to smartphones, tablets, um, or we will touch on the devices that come with them from the manufacturer, um, but we'll touch a bit on why the device from the manufacturer isn't going to be the best for this population. Great news is these technologies can be worn during bathing, showering, swimming. Um, the Libre itself uh, doesn't recommend being submerged for longer than 30 minutes or in water deeper than three feet. And the Dexcom doesn't um, actually, or actually has a much longer um, waterproof qualification, I guess. Um, the Dexcom says when properly placed, 
It can actually be under eight feet of water for up to 24 hours. Now, I don't know of any person who will be under eight feet of water for 24 hours, but the device would still work in that situation. All right, CGMs are gonna be able to provide 24 hours a day of blood sugar information. So they are going to tell us what our blood sugar currently is, and it's going to be able to tell us trends in terms of where we're going and where our blood sugar has been. CGMs have special features, including alarms that will tell us when the blood sugar is too high or too low. It also can tell us or can provide us the opportunity to track things as well. So not necessarily a feature that's going to be used too much with um, visually impaired clients, but if someone wanted to, they would be able to track and log their meals, their exercise, their medications. CGMs also allow for sharing of information or following. Um, so loved ones um, or diabetes care teams, whether it be your diabetes educator or your doctor, can actually follow your information along. Um, this has been a huge help with telemedicine being so big um, since the pandemic. And we are able to just log into our computer and see someone's blood sugars who may be, you know, 20 miles or more away. Um, in theory, if I had a client in California, I would be able to still see their blood sugar numbers, even though I'm here in Pennsylvania. Now, some CGMs do require calibration in which a blood sugar from the finger would be taken to verify against the sensor reading. And so I'll touch on that when we get to it. Um, and I'll kind of explain why those sensors aren't going to be as accessible for visually impaired individuals. So the first sensor that we'll spend some time talking about today is going to be the Dexcom G6. Um, for those of you who are visually impaired, the image that I have here on the screen is just the different pieces that come as part of this system. So we have a picture of a phone that displays the blood sugar information, or we also have a picture of the receiver from the manufacturer that would display blood sugar information. We also see the sensor applicator and the transmitter and sensor site that actually provides the blood sugar information. <clears throat> the Dexcom G6, we're going to start off just by talking a little bit about how it works. So this sensor is worn for 10 days. So we'll put it on and it will provide blood sugar information for a 10 day period. This sensor system has a transmitter that is separate from the sensor site that when we begin a sensor session, we put onto that sensor site itself. That transmitter we're going to use for a 90 day period or a three month period. So this part can be a little bit tricky for people who are new to the Dexcom because when we're changing the sensor site, we're not always changing that transmitter. So it's something during a training that we really drive home to the individual to make sure that they understand which piece am I getting rid of and which piece am I keeping. Dexcom G6 is approved by the FDA for use on the abdomen. In practice, technically off the label, I can tell you that individuals wear this sensor in other locations on their body as well. So individuals may wear this on the back of their arm. They may wear it on like their backside or kind of that like love handle hip area or even on the outer part of the thigh. Um, Dexcom results can go to, like we said, either their receiver or a smartphone or tablet. Um, the receiver that comes from Dexcom is not accessible to the low vision or blind. Um, so in, in this case, we are talking about using an external to the company device. The Dexcom will provide a new blood sugar reading as frequently as every five minutes. And again, it will trend those numbers for you. Dexcom can have alarms for a low blood sugar, high blood sugar, if you get a loss of signal between the sensor and your reading device, 
Um, it can actually predict low blood sugars for you or high blood sugars and will alert at you up to 20 minutes before that blood sugar happens, um, which is great because that can help you to treat a situation differently because you have more information. There are also customizable alert levels as there are with um, all of the sensors that are on the market. Best thing about the Dexcom G6 is that there are no finger stick blood sugar readings required. So you do not have to poke your finger with this sensor. It is approved to tell you it's blood, your blood sugar all on its own. When it comes to the initial setup of Dexcom, and this is gonna be the same for Libre or any of the other sensors that might be on the market, creating an account, logging into the app, setting up your alarm settings may be more difficult for the visually impaired. It's not gonna be impossible, but for example, the Dexcom G6 app, the customizable alerts and target blood sugar menus are scroll to select menus. And depending on what features you're used to using on your phone, it may be more difficult for a visual impairment. Um, I did play with it with the voiceover feature, and I was able to select and change those blood sugar levels. So it would just take a little bit of patience, I would think. Dexcom is a little bit different than Freestyle in that there are two apps that someone would use with Dexcom. So the Dexcom G6 app is gonna be the one that's on the device that is gonna tell you your blood sugar levels. The Dexcom Clarity app is gonna be on your device and that allows you to share your information with your care team. Um, in the Clarity app, again, in the setup phase, might be a little bit more challenging. There's gonna be uh, navigating certain menus to generate a share code. So for example, you would go into the app, you would go to your profile, you're going to click uh, authorize sharing, click generate code, click for how long you want to generate that code, and then there's going to be a 16 letter code that you would give to your provider. All possible steps, again, just might take some patience for someone with a visual impairment. My biggest recommendation would be if you're going to start on this sensor, same thing with the Libre. If you're able to get some assistance from maybe your diabetes educator or a care manager or a nurse in your prescriber's office, that might make that setup just a little bit faster for you. And it might make you feel a little bit more comfortable getting started. One of the things about the Dexcom G6 that I think poses a bit of a let's say speed bump for someone with a visual impairment, would be the fact that we need to enter a sensor code and a transmitter code into the app when we're getting started. Now, the good news is this code can be entered through a picture on the phone. Basically, it's gonna scan a QR code to get that information pulled into your system. Fortunately, the photo does not have to be high quality. So as long as you're able to get that code somewhere in the visual um, area of your camera, it should be able to capture that and get your sensor and your transmitter logged in. Again, if you're getting assistance the first time setting this up, this would be something that someone could help you maybe place your hands in the right kind of positioning so that you're able to feel what's the distance, what's the kind of the proximity that I need to have my phone in these um, compared to these scans. Now, I was thinking about it with my coworkers just yesterday. How are we gonna get the transmitter code scanned in? Because it's on a box and it's hard to tell when you're feeling a box what the different sides are gonna have. And so I figured it out for you guys. So if we're looking at the Dexcom sensor, I'm sorry, the transmitter box, there's going to be a tab that opens the box. When that tab is open, your sensor code is going to be on the side of the box that's connected to that tab. And the sensor code is going to be in the upper left-hand corner. For someone to know the placement and know exactly what side of the box to find it, it's going to make it a lot easier for you to scan that code into the system. Now, remember, the transmitter code only going to be entered within a or once in three months. 
So you're not going to have to worry about that one as frequently. And that one was a little bit harder to take that picture of. The transmitter, once in three months. The sensor itself, every 10 days. But it's easier to find the sensor code. It's going to be on the applicator. And that applicator is going to fit in your hand. There's going to be a flat side of the applicator. And that flat side is where that sensor code lives. So it's a lot easier to take a picture of the sensor code. Now, the next few slides um, I have in here for both the Dexcom and the Libre, really step-by-step -step directions on how to go through, how to insert the sensor, add the transmitter, get the app started. I don't want to spend a ton of time on these slides at this point because I don't want to short the information at the end of the PowerPoint. Assuming we have time, absolutely, I'll plan to come back and go through step-by-step -step how to do each sensor insertion. I'll just kind of talk through the basics here. When we're talking about the Dexcom G6, the first step is going to be to get the sensor site onto your body. So we're going to use the applicator. It has an insertion button. It's one click and the sensor site goes onto your body. The next step with the Dexcom is going to be to add a transmitter to that sensor site. The transmitter has one side that's very smooth and flat, has one side that's actually kind of two levels. That's going to be how we can feel around to feel where that's going to go into the sensor site on your abdomen. Once the transmitter is into that sensor site, we're going to go ahead and we're going to be able to start the sensor session. And by doing so, we're going to be able to start seeing our blood sugar readings. Once everything is on your body, we're going to go back into our app. It's very easy to get into the app, really, from an accessibility feature. You can simply just say, you know, hey, Siri, or whomever your um, phone's manager would be, and you're going to be able to say, open Dexcom G6. Makes it super simple for you. The transmitter should pair automatically with your phone. Usually there's a pop-up notification with an audible alert as well that says Bluetooth pairing request. And you can click the accept or the pair button actually on the bottom right portion of that notification. Right in the middle of the screen, there's a start sensor button. You'll click that and that'll initiate the two hour warm up period that we have for the Dexcom G6. When it's in that warm up period, you will not receive blood sugar numbers. So, in that two hours, if you were to have a, a need to check your blood sugar, unfortunately, we would be talking about a finger poke blood sugar if you were able to do that. Once your sensor session is started, you need to stay within 20 feet of your body where the transmitter is and your receiving device. If you go too far, like let's say your phone is upstairs in your bedroom and you have to run to take the trash out or something, once you come back together, they will resume, um, but you wouldn't get any information in terms of alerts or blood sugar information while you were too far away. After the 10 days is up and our sensor session has ended, the app will notify you that your sensor has ended. It actually, Dexom gives you quite a few reminders. It tells you at 24 hours, that I have 24 hours left, and reminds you again at eight hours, two hours, and 30 minutes. And those are pop-up alarm, kind of pop-up notifications on your phone. So if you're using, for example, speak screen or voiceover, you'd be able to read, quote unquote, those alarms. You'll pull the entire sensor site off of your body just like you would if you were removing a bandage. So you'll loosen, if it hasn't already, loosened part of the adhesive on your body, get your fingernail under there and just pull it off just like a Band-Aid. Now remember, we've said that the transmitter for Dexcom is used for three months. So you're able to kind of put the hand on either side of that sensor site and bend your hands down towards the floor. This actually breaks the sensor holder and that allows you to slide the transmitter out of that sensor holder so you can use it again for your next sensor. So again, that means you're only entering the transmitter photo once every three months. It's the sensor code um, photo that you'll be doing every 10 days. 
Next, we're going to spend some time talking about the Freestyle Libre 2. Um, so Freestyle Libre, you may have seen the 14-day sensor as well. That was their original one. We are now in the United States on Freestyle Libre 2. Freestyle Libre 3 has been approved, I believe, in uh, Europe. So hopefully it'll be coming here soon. Um, on this slide here, I do have a picture of the Freestyle Libre system. A um, few less devices here. So we, in this picture, we have um, a photo of a screen of a phone that has the blood sugar information on it. We have a picture of the receiver from the company that has the blood sugar information and a picture of the sensor itself, the sensor site, I should say, itself. A little bit different, the Freestyle Libre is approved for a 14-day wear. So we've got two full weeks here from this one. And it is an all-in-one device. So that does make it a little bit easier for sensor insertion, being that once it's inserted, we're only inserting one piece. Freestyle Libre is approved for use on the back of the arm. And unlike the Dexcom that people wear in other locations of their body, typically I really only see Libre being used on the arm. Big difference here between Dexcom and Libre is that Libre requires interaction with your device and the sensor in order to receive blood sugar information. So unlike the Dexcom, which automatically pushes information from your sensor to your phone, Libre requires you to interact with your phone and then interact with the sensor in order to see blood sugar information. Now, the receiver that comes from the company, again, is not an accessible device. Um, so we are gonna, again, wanna use a phone, a tablet, something along those sorts. Um, the Libre also will provide your current blood sugar information as well as trends regarding where you're going and where you've been. Interestingly, the Libre, in my, my experience here, um, the directional arrows or the trends in your blood sugar aren't as accessible from a voiceover or speak screen perspective as the directional information is from Dexcom. Um, but we'll get to that in another couple of minutes. Just like the Dexcom, Libre does provide um, alarms for low or high blood sugar, loss of signal between the sensor and the reading device as well. Now, interestingly, the Libre may recommend that someone complete a finger stick blood sugar. It is not required meaning if you don't check your blood sugar by a finger stick, it's not gonna stop giving you blood sugar information. But it may recommend that we do a finger stick. Typically, it will recommend that more frequently in like the first 12 hours that you're wearing the sensor. And I found out through practice here that the notification that it's recommending a finger stick doesn't come through on accessibility features. So using voiceover, speak screen, speak to, or text to speech, it's not gonna tell you that it's recommending a blood sugar reading. It is simply an image on the screen. For us sighted individuals, we would see a small magnifying glass with a small blood drop next to it. And that's them indicating, hey, might be worth checking your blood sugar with a finger stick. The sensor might not know you enough yet. But unfortunately, from an accessibility feature, that's not going to come through. So again, you don't have to provide a finger stick blood sugar to this sensor for it to continue to work. It's just something that is there that accessibility-wise may not translate. As I said, with the Dexcom, um, logging in, setting up an account um, in the Libre2 app may be slightly more difficult for someone with a visual impairment. Again, it does have those customizable alerts and target blood sugars that are the scroll to select menus. So it is possible, it just might take a little bit of patience to get that set up. If you have the ability to set that account and that app up with a sighted individual, it might make your life a little bit smoother transitioning to the sensor. 
The good news is from the Libre2 perspective, once your app is set up, there's no updating. So unlike with the Dexcom, where you have to update your sensor code every 10 days, once you're up and running with the Libre2 app, it's a little more straightforward to transition from one sensor to another. Again, the next couple of slides that I had written out, I'm more than happy to come back to if we have time, walks through the different steps in, in inserting a Libre sensor. We have two pieces here for the Libre sensor as well. We have a sensor pack that is kind of a round um, package. Honestly, it reminds me of a K cup. So for those of you who can feel and mid, uh, visualize in your mind um, a K cup, that's kind of what we're looking at when we're looking at the, um, the sensor pack. Round on the bottom, a little tab to, for the lid on top. We also have the sensor applicator, which is gonna look slightly different than the Dexcom does. It has a cover on the bottom that one would twist off in order to expose the applicator itself. We then have to line up the applicator over the sensor pack just right in order to get that sensor loaded into the applicator. So Dexcom had the benefit that the sensor site was already loaded in the applicator. With Freestyle, we have to load it in. Now they make it pretty foolproof. The applicator and the sensor pack only fit together in a very specific way. So as long as we're able to line up um, those two spots, it's pretty straightforward in terms of loading them together. Um, if you put the two pieces together and they aren't connecting, you can just rotate that sensor applicator on the top of the sensor pack until the two click together. Um, once we have the sensor loaded into the applicator, we take that applicator, it has kind of like a hollow tube almost on the bottom part of it that the sensor pack locates into and loads together. And we take that hollow tube, our hand is on the top of the applicator, which is hard solid plastic, we put that tube on the back of the arm and we'll push that solid plastic part into the arm, which actually does the insertion of the sensor for us. We'll hear a click when that, that push happens and that click indicates that the sensor is going into your arm. We then remove the applicator and that sensor is inserted for us. Again, final steps, we'd be going back to our application to go ahead and start the sensor. So you can ask your phone's assistant to help get you there. Now in the Libre2 app, I found that the voiceover feature tended to be more straightforward than the speak screen. Um, so while we're starting the sensor, middle of the screen, we're gonna locate the scan sensor button. Once we've clicked that, it'll let us go ahead and scan that sensor. Now to scan the sensor, I think I mentioned already, but we're gonna take the top of the back of our phone, usually where the camera is, and we're gonna take that area of the phone and we're gonna hold it just over the sensor. Doesn't have to touch the sensor and it actually can read right through your clothing. Once you're holding it over there, your phone will vibrate and that'll indicate that it has actually done the reading for you. Next then on the screen, you'll see that you have a sensor countdown, basically. So it'll say sensor ready at, and then whatever time. This Libre has a one hour warm up time, so slightly less of a warm up than our Dexcom does. On the screen, it'll also indicate how many minutes are left remaining before that sensor is going to be fully functional. Just like the Dexcom sensor, we will not get information in terms of what our blood sugar is during that one hour warm up time. Um, the speak screen reads out the entire kind of hidden menu on this sensor ready at whatever time screen before it tells you how much time you have until your remain until your sensor is active. So for example, on my screen, it says, you know, Freestyle Libre, it says Abigail Chesterson, it says Logbook, it goes through all of a menu that you don't even see on the screen before it then tells you what is on your screen. So it's not, un it's not going to not work. It's just going to take you maybe an extra minute to hear what time your sensor will be ready and how much time remains until then. 
Now, Libre recommends staying within 33 feet of the sensor in order to get those alarms and alerts. To scan the sensor, as I mentioned, we do need to interact with the app on the phone and the sensor in order to get the information. So every time you want to see your blood sugar, you have to open the app. Again, your phone assistant can help. You'll then find the check glucose button on the screen, which tends to live at the bottom of the screen. Um, you'll check that button that says check glucose. It'll show a ready to scan screen on your phone. And then you'll complete that screen, or I'm sorry, you'll complete that scan again with your phone touching next to um, the sensor itself. Um, if we have voiceover on, that ready to scan screen will read out for you. So you'll know exactly when to go ahead and complete the scan to check your blood sugar. Once the uh, sensor has scanned, you'll feel a vibrate on your phone, which is gonna indicate that the sensor has been read. A scan complete window will show and then will go away. Again, if you have the voiceover feature on on your phone, it will read out that scan complete and then you're able to have it read out your blood sugar as well. The blood sugar reading will display at the top middle portion of your screen. So you could hold your phone, I'm sorry, hold your finger over that area in order to read out your number. With the Freestyle Libre, the way their algorithm is programmed from a you know, computer perspective, the directional arrow of where your blood sugar is going will not read out. So whether you are using voiceover, whether you are using speak screen, it will only tell you what your blood sugar is. It will not tell you where you're going. Both the Dexcom and the Freestyle also cannot read out your trend graph from where you have been. So Dexcom will tell you where you're going. Freestyle, unfortunately, the readout at this point does not. If your phone is unable to scan your Libre sensor for any reason, it will vibrate and then display an error message that can be read out again with voiceover, not with speak screen. The uh, error will say scan error, your scan was unsuccessful, tap the scan button and scan again. You can click okay to clear the error and then find the check glucose button at the bottom of the screen and try again. I honestly don't know why sometimes it doesn't scan correctly. It happens to me and I don't exactly understand what the rhyme or reason is. I just don't know if it's a phone timeout or what it may be. So just because you get a scan error doesn't mean there is something wrong with your sensor. Just clear the error by clicking okay, find the check glucose button again at the bottom of the screen and scan again. At the end of the 14 day period, again, the app will notify you that the sensor session has ended. You'll pull the entire site off of your body just like you would if you were removing a Band-Aid and you'll dispose of the sensor in accordance to your local guidance for disposing of materials exposed to body fluids. Um, you don't have to keep any part of the Libre 2 sensor. The whole thing just goes right in the trash. And if you were gonna place another sensor, you would follow the same insertion steps. You would put it in, you would click to scan new sensor and it's gonna start a new sensor session for you. Very briefly, I'm gonna to touch on the Medtronic Guardian Connect sensor. It's not one that most people are familiar with. Um, it is one that more commonly goes with an insulin pump, less commonly is a standalone glucose sensor. Um, again, the image that's on this screen is a picture of the phone that is displaying the blood sugar number, a picture of the sensor site itself. Um, the sensor is a small kind of half moon shaped white um, transmitter, a sensor insertion site, um, applicator, excuse me, and then a charger for the transmitter itself. So I would say if I had to say system like pieces wise, I would say the Medtronic has more similar number of pieces as the Dexcom. Um, the freestyle is slightly more simplified. 
Now the Medtronic Guardian Connect is only worn for seven days. So we're talking about a once a week transition here. It is fully approved for use on the stomach, the backside, or the back of the arm. So it is fully approved for more wearable areas. It connects to a smartphone app, the Guardian Connect smartphone app to receive your readings. It tells you a new blood sugar level every five minutes, so similar to the Dexcom. Um, and it, again, also provides both high blood sugar alerts, low blood sugar alerts, loss of signal, going to tell you your current blood sugar, and it also does have directional information available. The Medtronic Guardian Connect can provide predictive alarms up to 60 minutes before a high or a low blood sugar. So it can give you a little bit more forewarning that something is changing, um, but the difficult insertion and the difficult starting of a sensor, in my opinion, really significantly limits its use in a visually impaired patient. And biggest thing is that the Dex, or I'm sorry, the Medtronic requires at least twice daily finger stick calibration blood sugars. So twice a day, at least, it will alert at the user to poke your finger and check your blood sugar, enter that blood sugar into the system so that it can verify the sensor. So in my opinion, that makes it completely not applicable to someone who has a visual impairment because we have to use a regular traditional glucometer if we're using this sensor. So that's all we're going to say about that one. There are a few things I just want to review here that are going to talk about making CGMs accessible, and then we're going to touch briefly on eligibility and coverage. So Alexa works with Dexcom G6 um, through a SugarMate skill. So enabling the SugarMate skill on your Alexa device, and I apologize if through this we are getting your Alexas all riled up, <laughs> um, but we're going to enable that SugarMate skill on your Amazon device, um, and you'll be able to hear glucose readings from your CGM. Um, you don't need to be a SugarMate user through the app on your smartphone in order, in order to enable the skill on your Amazon device. Um, you would basically say, Alexa, ask SugarMate for my latest reading, and she'll read out an example would be, it's 153 and rising, last checked about five minutes ago, it's five higher than your previous reading. So the SugarMate skill really gives you a lot of information. And it, again, will also tell you where you're going, which is great. Uh, Siri and Dexcom are also very user-friendly together. Um, some features of the Siri with Dexcom are a little more straightforward for older iPhones, although I was able to make it accessible on my, I think I have an iPhone 13. Um, so within the Dexcom app, you are able to set up Siri shortcuts and customize a phrase. So in the Dexcom app, you are able to say, hey Siri, what's my blood sugar? And then anytime you want to know, you can ask Siri. So for example, let's see if mine will work. Hey Siri, what's my blood sugar? Okay, viewing. You're 107 and steady. So my Siri tells me my blood sugar is 107 and steady. And that's exactly how the Siri would work. You don't have to open your phone. You don't have to open the app. Now, with Dexcom, if you're relying on alerts that will tell you if you're going high or low, Siri won't read those out on her own. You would have to be alerted and then ask what your sugar level is. Um, you can- I'm not sure I understand. She's still trying to talk to me. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, you can also ask her to open the Dexcom G6 app, and then from there, you can use speak screen or voiceover to read out the blood sugar and the direction. Now, I found very user-friendly the voiceover feature um, or the talkback feature on the smartphone to work very well with both of these devices. It'll allow you to hear your current blood sugar reading within any of the CGM apps. Um, the voiceover will read the blood sugar result when it is selected on the screen. As I mentioned in Libre, it doesn't read out the direction, but in Dexcom it does and would indicate whether you were steady, rising, or falling. Speak screen works really well as well 
I felt like it was a little more user-friendly within the Dexcom app compared to the Freestyle Libre app, but it allows you to hear the information that's displayed on the app screen, including for the warm-up time that you're in the warm-up phase and how long until your sensor is active. Again, speak screen um, for the Libre is not going to indicate which direction your blood sugar is going. Speak selection, I really didn't find super user friendly with the CGMs. Um, in theory, the speak selection would allow your user to hear the information selected on the screen within an app. Um, really, the blood sugar information within these apps isn't really set up to be quote unquote like selected, which meant that it was more difficult to select it to have the phone read it out. So that could be more difficult from a visual impairment perspective. So in my experience here, um, the voiceover or talkback feature or the speak screen feature were much more accessible for these CGMs. Now the text to speech function on some phones ran into an issue with the Freestyle Libre recently. Um, we actually got a message from Libre telling us that Apple devices that have been upgraded to iOS 16 may run into problems with the text to speech feature. So they were really recommending don't update if that's the feature that you rely on for reading out your Libre. Um, they found during pre-release testing of the new operating system that the text-to-speech feature was acting incorrectly. If you've already upgraded and you can't go back, like we said, fixes for the interim would be the voiceover or the speak screen. Last couple slides here, like I said, are going to be on the cost and eligibility for CGM. So, Commercial insurance coverage varies, but typically commercial insurance is, I would say, more likely to cover a CGM with flexibility. Um, and that'll make sense here in just a second. Um, so Medicare is pretty strict with coverage for CGM. So to qualify under a Medicare plan, you have to have either type 1 or type 2 diabetes. You must use an insulin pump or take three or more insulin injections per day. And your provider has to document that your insulin treatment requires frequent adjustment based on your blood sugar readings. They also have some guidelines in terms of um, how frequently you are seeing your provider. And I'm not sure if these two... Um, uh, requirements adjusted at all for the pandemic, but I'm going to read them as stated currently on the website. So within six months prior to ordering the CGM, an individual had to have an in-person visit with your treating practitioner to evaluate your diabetes control and determine that you meet the criteria. From then, every six months after the initial prescription of the CGM, the individual has an in-person visit with the treating practitioner to assess adherence to the CGM and your diabetes plan. So basically they're saying it, at least prior to the pandemic, that you needed to have an in-person visit with your provider at least every six months in order to continue CGM use. Now, for those of you out there with diabetes, Typically, you're probably seeing your provider in person and or virtually at least every three to six months. So these two requirements aren't the hard ones to qualify under. I would love if Medicare would cover for more conditions than individuals who are taking three or more insulin injections per day. From a diabetes educator perspective, we know that there are plenty of other medications that are regularly prescribed for diabetes that would be equally as beneficial using a CGM. Also, CGM is going to provide us more usable information than just a finger stick blood sugar does. So I cannot wait until CGMs are the norm and finger stick blood sugars are less common. So I'm going to do everything I can to try to make that happen because CGMs, I believe in so, so much. 
With Medicaid plans, um, unfortunately, some states will only cover CGM for Medicaid patients who have type 1 diabetes. So even if a Medicaid patient has type 2 and takes three or more insulin injections per day, some states will still not cover that CGM under a Medicaid plan. Um, I have a hyperlink there for providers, really, to look at a great resource for a guide to state Medicaid coverage for CGM, and we'll make sure that gets provided out to you guys as well. Um, CGM may be covered as a pharmacy benefit, so you might be able to pick it up at your local pharmacy, or depending on your insurance, it also may be covered as a durable medical equipment supply. So if it's denied at the pharmacy, you're likely going to be able to get it sent to your house basically through a mail order third party company. Pricing really varies. So Dexcom is more expensive out of pocket, if you will, compared to the Libre. Through commercial insurance, though, Dexcom coverage really is going to vary from a minimal cost to a high cost, depending on your copay or your deductible. Medicare patients are going to have the same copay for Dexcom as they would for other CGMs. And for a Medicare patient, if they have a secondary insurance, that secondary insurance is typically going to cover that copay, so they may not have any out-of-pocket cost. In practice, Medicaid would cover fully. But again, whether or not your state is going to cover that may vary. In my opinion, Dexcom self-pay, meaning if your insurance doesn't cover, really Dexcom is cost prohibitive. Um, it may cost $550 to $860 per transmitter. And again, that's every three months. And then it could cost an additional $330 for a one month supply of sensors. So that's three 10 day sensors. I don't know of anybody really who would want to just go ahead and shell out, you know, well over about $1,200 or so at the high end on your sensors pretty regularly. So commercial insurance, or I'm sorry, insurance in general is really going to be the best way to go about getting a Dexcom. Now the Freestyle Libre 2 through insurance, again, most privately insured patients or patients with Medicare or Medicaid will pay anything between $0 and $60 per month for the sensors. Um, Self-pay, if you really wanted to do it, you could get two sensors, that's a one month supply, for only $130. So I absolutely have worked with patients in the past who would spend the $130, maybe wear a sensor for two weeks now, work on a couple of things, wait a couple of weeks or a couple of months, wear that second sensor simply because the amount of information they're going to get from the sensor was still beneficial and it helped spread that cost out. Both companies do also have patient assistance programs. So this is where we're going to wrap up today. Dexcom and Libre are going to require application and supporting documentation. Um, biggest things to note for Dexcom, you must live in the United States. In order to qualify for their patient assistance program, though, you do have to have type 1 diabetes. You can have no insurance or you can't be enrolled in Medicare or Medicaid. So limitation there being, do you have insurance? If you do, you may not qualify. Um, there is an age limit. You have to be two years or an age minimum, I should say. You have to be two years or older and your household income has to be below 400% of the federal poverty line. Libre has a free sensor trial program. So it's not really a patient assistance program long-term, but you could start out on your free trial. Type one or type two diabetes must be 18 years or older. But again, you're not eligible if you have Medicare, Medicaid, or another state or federal healthcare program. And then interestingly, if you live in Massachusetts, Puerto Rico, or other US territories, again, you're also not eligible for this free trial program. So there are options out there where you could get some maybe experience with the sensor if your insurance didn't cover potentially, um, but unfortunately there are some hoops you have to jump through or requirements you have to meet. So that completes the uh, preparation material that I have for you guys. Um, as I mentioned, please, please reach out to Accessible Pharmacy with any questions that you've come up through today's presentation. Um, as I talked with Alex previously, I'm more than willing to share uh, 
the resources that I put into today's presentation. Um, I really, through this, like I said, learned a lot and I'm really motivated to do what we can to get CGM approved for individuals with a visual impairment. Um, that alone, I think, should qualify somebody to use a CGM. Um, so I know my team and I are really kind of passionate about this now um, because we believe in it so much. So again, I want to thank everyone so much for coming out today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen, but I really appreciate the turnout and I'm really hopeful that this has helped you guys. Abby, you're awesome. I, I cannot say and like enough things about you. You're absolutely amazing. And we're just so thankful um, that you would do this with everybody and just be here with us today. Uh, you were just absolutely fantastic. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming today and listening, tuning in, registering, um, sharing the news about this webinar. Um, and thank you, thank you, thank you again, Abby, for doing this with us. As I said earlier, Abby is a star in diabetes education, and we're just so thankful um, that she's just part of our team. Um, your experience in this space, coupled with like your ability to talk to patients, talk to us, talk to providers, um, and just discuss solutions and plans, it's so important. And yeah, we absolutely love it. And you're a rock star. Uh, thank you for being here and discussing all of this with us. Uh, and like, once again, thank you everyone for attending. And I hope uh, this was a helpful experience and a helpful webinar. Um, and thank you, Holly. Uh, I think we just want to extend a lot of gratitude for you uh, for helping, you know, with the accessibility of this webinar. As I mentioned earlier, and as Abby said, we will be sending up a follow-up email in the next few days. That follow-up email uh, will have a few things. First, um, this webinar has been recorded. Um, there will be a video and an audio link. Uh, in that follow-up email as well as on our website uh, so that you can go back and have access to this webinar in the future. Um, other than that, like I said, that it will be available on our website and on our YouTube page. Also in that follow-up email and, our, and on our website will be um, a copy of Abby's presentation uh, with links and resources to everything that she discussed. Um, also, when you get that email, please go ahead and respond to it and let us know your feedback on the accessibility of this webinar uh, and how we can continue to make programs like this more accessible in the future. And I would just like to say before we leave that if you are not a patient of ours here at Accessible Pharmacy, we would absolutely love for you to join us. Uh, we learn about how to support more patients by listening to our current ones. So we would absolutely love to have your feedback as a patient so that we can learn from you about how to be more accessible and what other services we should be providing. You can also speak with us to determine if you're eligible for a Dexcom or a Freestyle Librite device, or please reach out if you have any diabetes related questions. Uh, the easiest way to work with us is simply to just give us a phone call. Um, our phone number is 1-888-633-7007. That's 1-888-633-7007. Other than that, we would just like to say thank you for attending our Blindness and Diabetes webinar. We were so happy to put it together with Penn Medicine and have you all attend. Uh, please check out our information on our website for our upcoming Blind Health Expo. And other than that, we will be in touch with the follow-up email and have a great rest of your week.